Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm Michael Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club. I'm the former general manager of CBS Radio Network, now journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus, and executive producer of the Kalb Report public broadcasting series moderated by journalist Marvin Kalb. We thank you for joining us today for our virtual headliner book event with journalist Karen Gray Houston, author of Daughter of the Boycott, Carrying on a Montgomery Family Civil Rights Legacy. Our headliner joins us remotely today from her new home in Clover, South Carolina. Our event is webcast to protect everyone from COVID-19. The National Press Club is committed to delivering our events this year as safely as possible. We will accept questions from the audience. I'll ask as many of those questions as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. Seventy years before the May 25th killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis ignited this summer's demonstrations on racial injustice across the country, a young man named Hilliard Brooks was shot and killed by a white police officer in a confrontation as he tried to board a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Thomas Gray had played football with Brooks and was outraged by the killing. He began a protest leading to a large-scale downtown march to register voters and to stand up to police brutality. Five years later, Gray was on the front lines of the Montgomery bus boycott, where he was constantly threatened. He stood with his brother, Fred Gray, an attorney for Rosa Parks, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., and Claudette Colvin, who had been the plaintiff in the case that forced Alabama to desegregate its buses. In Daughter of the Boycott, Carrying on a Montgomery Family Civil Rights Legacy, award-winning journalist Karen Gray Houston illuminates the story of Thomas and Fred Gray, her father and her uncle, and their commitment to the civil rights movement. Last month's passing of Congressman John Lewis was a stark reminder that we're now quickly losing the first generation participants of and the witnesses to the civil rights movement. And as this summer's protests have demonstrated, there is much, much more to be done. Over the course of her four-decade career in broadcast journalism, Karen Gray Houston worked in Boston, New York, and here in Washington, where she became a fixture at both WTOP Radio and WTTG Fox 5 Television News. She wrote for United Press International, covered the White House and Capitol Hill for NBC News, anchored ABC Radio Network News, and she stands as witness to the civil rights work of her father, Thomas, and her uncle, Fred. Karen Gray Houston, welcome to the National Press Club. Mike, it's so wonderful to be here, and uh, I can't wait to share some of these stories with you. Karen, to begin, it sounds like this book has been building within you for most of your life. Talk about that. <laughs> Mike, I actually, I didn't know that as a young child. I knew a little bit about the bus boycott, but my parents didn't talk about it a lot. And you know, I, I look at them like um, uh, the children of the survivors of the Holocaust. They, they didn't discuss what happened. Uh, soldiers who came back after uh, World War II and you know, the Korean War didn't discuss the, the horrors that they saw there with their children. And so as I was growing up, my parents were just raising me and I, I did meet Rosa Parks, she visited our family home, but I was too young and inexperienced and didn't know the right questions to ask her about the important role that she played in that boycott. And so uh, the story really came to the forefront as I became an adult. Um, I learned that my father, late in his life, was, was writing his own story about the boycott. My uncle Fred, had already written a book, uh, Bus Ride to Justice, which was about the boycott, but also about this remarkable career that he has had as a civil rights attorney. And so when dad retired from a job uh, as a federal administrative law judge, he decided that he was going to write a book. He retired to become a caretaker for my mother, who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And so when dad died and had only written a little bit of that book that he was interested in. It, it was as if he had thrown down the gauntlet and I had to pick it up. So that's how I started writing this book. In reading the book, as much as anything else, 
this is a story of what I would call quiet courage. It reminds us there were many, many fine people of strength in addition to those whose stories we know that made the civil rights movement. Um, talk about the roles of family and community in mustering that quiet courage. You're right. This, this is a story of family. It's a story of community. A uh, lot of people were involved in the boycott. It didn't just happen that day that Rosa Parks was on the bus and, you know, the media portrayed her as this sweet, demure seamstress who was uh, quiet and uh, on the bus that day tired and just didn't give up her seat. Rosa Parks was an activist. Uh, a lot of people didn't know that. She was involved with the NAACP. She was the secretary for the local branch of the NAACP. She was involved as an investigator of uh, alleged rapes of black women that people didn't know about. At some point, she was going to conventions of the NAACP. And so she was involved and really wanted to uh, see some change did she say uh, she would rather be lynched than mistreated? I mean, I found that out when I was doing some research of her writings at the Library of Congress. Uh, but it wasn't just her. Uh, Joanne Robinson was a woman who was an English professor at Alabama State uh, College for Negroes is what it was called then. It's Alabama State University now. Uh, she took over as the head of the Women's Political Council, which had been chaired by a woman named Mary their works. They were both teachers at Alabama State, English teachers, and they were angry about what was happening on the buses in Montgomery and how black people were being treated, and they were taking notes. They sent their students from class out on buses to write down names of bus drivers and the name numbers on buses uh, so that they could meet with local uh, city officials and officials from the bus line to demand better treatment. There was a man named E.D. Nixon, who was the head of the NAACP and acted in a lot of voting rights uh, groups and the uh, League of Women Voters and things like that, uh, trying to get a better deal. There was a lot going on behind the scenes before that day of reckoning when Rosa was on the bus, including uh, activism by four other women who were plaintiffs in that lawsuit you mentioned that overturned uh, segregated busing in Montgomery. And all of these things uh, were, you know, the planning happened together. It was, they, you know, they got together, they joined together. Martin Luther King moved to town at just about the right time, 1954, when, when you know, it was like all these things were coming together and he was brought into some of those meetings with the city officials and the bus, bus officials. Um, a lot going on. You talk about Claudette Colvin, um, who's still with us today. Um, and, and she came before Rosa Parks. I think she was 15 years old when she wouldn't give up her seat on the bus. We don't hear that much about her in, uh, in the general news his history of this. Talk a little bit about Claudette Colvin. Claudette was 15 years old. She was riding on a bus one day with some of her friends from her high school, Booker Washington High School, and the bus got crowded and the bus driver looked back and said, hey, I'm gonna need a seat back there. And normally that meant, you know, black people got, you gotta get up. And, and it didn't, if there were black people seated across the rows on both sides of the aisle, it meant everybody in that row had to get up because black people had to sit behind white people. And that particular day, other friends of hers got up to move, but Claudette sat down and she just said, you know, I have, a, I have a right to sit here. And she felt inspired by, uh, this was in March of 1955. In February, this followed after Negro History Month. And she had a very progressive teacher who'd been teaching the kids in her class about, you know, what their constitutional rights were and how they were being treated unfairly and how they shouldn't have to go to a, a shoe store and and draw an outline of their foot on a brown paper bag so that they could buy a pair of shoes. And so she was thinking about all those things when the bus driver told her to get up and she refused. He sent a police officer, he called a police officer, and this particular officer was a traffic officer who couldn't give her a ticket. And so the bus went on and they thought everything was, you know, okay. But then 
two police officers got on the bus later and dragged her off and took her to jail. Uh, my uncle thought, plum in his lap, he was really looking for a case to desegregate, to test the segregation on the buses. And he thought, this is perfect. And people rallied around her, including Rosa Parks, who with her mother uh, sold cookies to raise money for her legal defense and things like that. Except that two months later, Claudette got pregnant and uh, the black leadership assumed or just decided that a pregnant unwed mother was not the face they wanted to see on their test case of segregation. It's so a, that's who she It's a remarkable, remarkable story. Um, talk about, let's go back to your parents. Talk about your parents as the role models for you and your family. You, you, you began by saying that they didn't talk about the, the boycott when, when you were a child and you made the analogy to the Holocaust and um, there certainly are a lot of Holocaust survivors who never discussed that with their, with, with their children. Um, talk about your parents as role models for, for your family. Thomas and Juanita Gray, I think, were, as we were growing up, uh, wove a little cocoon around me and my two younger brothers, Thomas Jr. and Frederick. Uh, they tried to protect us from the, the evils of segregation as much as they could. We lived in a totally, you know, in Montgomery in the 50s, this, everything was totally segregated. Black people lived in their own world, white people lived in their own world. And, you know, you couldn't go to restaurants. Uh, you had to go around to the back door. They had water fountains that were set aside for the white people. It was a horrible way to live. And as much as they could, my parents protected us from that. So what I do have a, a vivid recollection of is after the boycott was over, my mother one day dressed up me and my little brothers and marched a block down the street to a bus stop. And we, this was gonna be our first ride on a bus. We didn't ride the buses, my dad had a car. And so he, he was a businessman. Uh, so we were not accustomed to the bus, but we got, she marched us right down to the front of the bus. And we sat right behind the white bus driver because she wanted us to know, and she told us how it felt to be Negro kids who did not have to sit in the back of a bus. You talk about that memory of, of being on the bus in the course of researching the book. Um, were there other memories, perhaps some that were suppressed, uh, that came back to you? Did you have any epiphanies along the way here as you were researching the book, that, that oh my gosh moments that you remembered something that had long been forgotten? Well, there were, they weren't really long forgotten, just memories that made me go, hmm. Um, for example, my mother was from Shreveport, Louisiana. And every summer we would go to Louisiana to visit her and we would take the train. Dad owned a uh, radio TV and appliance store and, and he was busy with the business. Uh, and so he would plunk us down on, on a, a the train, and we always had to ride on the in the colored car uh, for colored people, and it was the car next to the engine, uh, and we would take our own lunches because you couldn't eat in a dining car on the train, and so I, you know, remember what that was like. Uh, it was just ridiculous, <laughs> uh, and so uh, one year, and this was after the boycott, when my dad decided that he wanted to go to law school. And that, um, now this is a little long story. My, my mother had a sister who was a chemist who lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And she was working on nuclear weapons research. Uh, you know, she's the hidden figure in our family, but she, her nanny uh, had, had left town and she needed somebody to help take care of her two children. Uh, and so it was a perfect time. Dad said, okay, you guys go out there and I'll get a year of law school under my belt in Cleveland. And so we got on the, the train again. It was, a, you know, the, the same, get on the bus, take, I mean, get on the train, take your, your you know, fried chicken and your lunch, sit in the, in the car next to the, the engine. But once we got out past Texas into New Mexico, 
the Pullman porter said, hey, you can move out and sit any place on the train you want. And we got and walked through several cars up to the front, towards the front of, well, not the front of the train, but a car where white people were seated. seated. And we got to eat in the car, the dining car that had white table for us. We didn't have anything special to eat, maybe BLT sandwiches or something, but we could eat and talk to white people like, like normal, like, like a normal situation. And so that was in the 60s, but it just showed that the whole world was not like the Deep South. As you were growing up then, you became more conscious along the way of certainly things that were going on in the, in the, in the 60s across the country. Um, talk about your own evolution uh, in that process. I'm just going to say that my family, and I, in the book, write about us as displaced refugees. Dad wanted to get his law degree. He had been a successful businessman. That business in Montgomery uh, was one that a lot of people bought there. You know, he sold TV sets at a time when television sets were new. And uh, when Martin Luther King came to town with Coretta King, they bought their first washing machine and TV sets from my dad's store. Well, uh, he was, after the boycott was over, dad figured, well, why don't I go through with my plan, like my uncle did, leave the South, go up North someplace that will admit a black student to law school and uh, get a law degree. The plan was to come back to Montgomery and practice law with my uncle. And they could both, you know, fight segregation together. So we, he went to law school and for whatever reason, I can't prove anything, he was never able to pass the bar in Alabama. He passed the bar in Ohio, which he did, and he ended up having a really remarkable career as an attorney practicing civil rights law, poverty law, fair housing law. And, and that was needed in Ohio. I mean, my uncle was desegregating the South and he was desegregating the North. So that was kind of what our, our lives developed into. Did those influences um, have play a role in your going into journalism? Well, I, you know, I don't think about it that way. My, my dad actually and my uncle both wanted me to go to law school and, you know, be a lawyer like them. Uh, I, I just had other interests, you know, I thought, and, and it was at a time when there were more opportunities, you know, uh, when my father and my uncle were going to college and getting out of college, there were very few options for black people. You could be a teacher or a preacher, basically. And then every now and then you'd get somebody who would go to med school and become a, a doctor or a few people who went to law school and became lawyers. Like uncle, my uncle Fred, who I call Uncle Teddy to this day, uh, was the second lawyer in Montgomery at the time. Um, I just decided I wanted to... Uh, go into journalism, I, I, I developed an interest in it. And when I decided to do it, it came at a time when there was a lot of pressure on newsrooms, radio and TV stations to hire minorities. Um, not because they wanted to, but because there was the threat of boycotts. You know, Jesse Jackson and, and some of his civil rights groups and others uh, were threatening to boycott organizations that didn't hire black people. And it came on the heels of all the rioting that was going on, you know, and lots, lots of civil rights rioting happening, people, uh, you know, fighting for equal justice. And um, newsrooms wanted to get the story and they couldn't really often send white people to get the story or if they really wanted a, a better story, they needed to have more minorities and so I sort of got in on a wave of minority hiring that was happening. Let's, let's stay with newsrooms for, for a few minutes. Um, back in 2013, here at the National Press Club, uh, we presented a, uh, one of our public broadcasting series programs, The Calb Report, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the 1963 March on Washington. And among our guests were Congressman John, uh, John Lewis, Andrew Young, Julian Bond, Gwen Eiffel, and Dorothy Gilliam. Uh, Dorothy uh, was a colleague of mine at George Washington University who was the first African-American woman reporter at the Washington Post. 
Um, it was very striking that the day after the march, uh, there was absolutely no mention of Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech on the front page of the Washington Post. Um, Dorothy talked about the fact that the, the, the Post coverage didn't have it in part because she was not allowed to cover the march and there were no African American editors at the table when the decisions were made on coverage um, at, at that time. So 57 years after that now and given what you've just said about your entry into newsrooms and more than 40 years in, in, in broadcast journalism, how do you think we're doing in the nation's newsrooms uh, at, at this point? <laughs> and now that I'm not working in one, I can speak freely is what you're suggesting. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I first started working, I worked for UPI, I worked at a radio station in Boston at a time of uh, real, really a lot of racial turmoil, the desegregate forced busing is what they called it. Uh, the, the desegregation, that there was a lot of violence uh, directed at students. I mean, I saw uh, white women and their children throwing rocks and eggs at buses of black kids going to school. Uh, I think you needed to have black people, you need diversity in newsrooms so that you can have some perspective. Uh, and I, I, I felt that at every stage of my career, um, that it was important to at least have me articulate, well, here's what I'm, you know, the things that, that uh, maybe a white reporter didn't, didn't think of or something that I knew that maybe I could add to the conversation. Uh, though I do remember after a while feeling that I didn't want to be the black reporter on the black beat where I'm, the only thing I'm given uh, respect for covering is stories about my race. And I think what should happen is that everybody should learn how to cover every story. So I, you know, uh, and I think that is still the case. It should be. Thank you. Um, there is, um, there's an area of journalism that some people are not aware of called the black press. Um, which is different than coverage of, of, of issues. Um, these were and still are incredibly important newspapers um, and other publications that were foreign about the African American community. Publications like the Pittsburgh Courier and Freedom's Journal and the Chicago Defender. Um, they have been instrumental in the, in the civil rights movement. They're struggling. Um, many of them have, um, have fallen by the wayside. Can you talk a little bit about the black press and whether your research involved um, uh, elements of that? Because their coverage was often different than what we might refer to as the mainstream press. Right, because they could get in and really find out what was going on that people wouldn't share with white reporters. Uh, my dad used to throw newspapers as a kid and he used to throw the, the Pittsburgh paper and the Chicago Defender in, in, to black people in his neighborhood. Um, uh, some have fallen off the way, wayside, like uh, too bad about Ebony Magazine. You know, Ebony is now gone. Jet Magazine, I tell a little story in my book about how my uncle uh, was, um, uh, there's a picture of him in one of the issues in his underwear because he wasn't, he was, um, a minister who should not have had to serve in the military and they were trying to force him to serve. Um, and he had to file a lawsuit that went up to, you know, the top of the ranks. And they finally said, well, you know, he is a minister. He does have a right not to have to, but he have to um, serve. But he had to go through the motions of having a physical and the press was called in and they were allowed to take pictures of him in his underwear, which was just totally ridiculous. Uh, but uh, back to the, you know, the, we still have some vestiges of that, you know, there's Essence Magazine. There's still some magazines and newspapers left where, uh, you know, um, the cons the, they're covering stories that, that oftentimes the mainstream misses and doesn't care about. So there, there's, a, I think there's a place for, for them. 
in 2008, of course, we elected Barack Obama as President of the United States in what many of us believed was just a giant step forward for our nation uh, in terms of racial equality and social justice, one of the most significant actions in the history of, of this country. He served for eight years. Uh, now, 12 years after his first election, we are a deeply troubled nation um, over, over the same issues. Um, do you get a sense that we've gone backwards since, since he left office? And, and was the election of Donald Trump in some ways a backlash by a, a faction of America? I, I think what we are seeing is just how deeply entrenched, entrenched racism is in the fabric of the society. You know, you kind of thought, well, look, oh, a black man elected to be president. My father thought that he would never live to see the day. And he was so thrilled about it that after uh, Obama was elected, he went out and bought the Audacity of Hope, Obama's book, and he gave it out to all his friends for Christmas presents. Uh, and everybody thought, okay, you know, we're gonna see a, a whole post-racial America. And then what happened? Uh, Trump was elected and uh, he set a tone that, um, you know, against immigrants and, you know, well, I don't want to go into that whole history, but um, yes, it's a, I don't even know, you know, I don't want to sit up here and, and spend our, our 25 minutes talking about Donald Trump and what he's done to the country. But I do see uh, Joe Biden and, and uh, Kamala Harris as being um, a real hope for the country. And, you know, um, I have my fingers crossed. I saw a, um, uh, a cartoon in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution yesterday, and it, it amused me to no end. It showed a bus with uh, a, a Kamala Harris campaign bus, you know, with the um, uh, Democratic uh, Veep nominee. And you see Kamala on the ground, and she's looking up at the sky, and there's a big white cloud, and Rosa Parks is on the cloud, and she's looking down saying, I love your bus. I, that, that just says it for me. <laughs> we have a we have a question from a uh, friend and former National Press Club president Jeff Ballou. Many, Hi, Jeff. <laughs> many of the activists of your of your parents era and earlier people like Ida B. Wells uh, were well aware of the power of journalism and used it to advance the movement in order to combat official and unofficially sanctioned terror lynchings bombings and murders including that of Emmett Till plus legalized racism, including voter suppression and separate accommodations, by getting the press to cover the horrific acts. Um, do you see parallels in the work of the journalists then and the work of journalists today? Uh, by getting us to cover what, what's going on? I, everybody's writing about everything right now. I'm using my book as a way to get a conversation out there about, are we gonna learn more lessons from history that will help us to make some changes? I mean, if we start looking at, for example, the white police brutality and you know George Floyd now and um, Hilliard Brooks 70 years ago, as I was doing the research on my book, I kept stumbling across police brutality. Uh, and I wrote about it, uh, Michael Brown and, uh, you know, Eric Garner and uh, Freddie Gray in Baltimore. Um, and, and then and when I was in Montgomery, I, there was, I went to the neighborhood I used to live in as a little girl, and people had these signs in their yards that said, uh, justice for Greg Gunn. Greg Gunn was a black man who was walking home from a, a party, a card party, late one night, and a white police officer saw him in his own neighborhood. Uh, in Greg Gunn's neighborhood, and he had, uh, stopped him because he thought he was, he looked suspicious, and he beat the man, and he tased him, and he shot and killed him, and so, uh, you know, we're still talking about this, we're still writing about it, and how are we going to learn? The reason people are out in the streets now is because the same things keep happening over and over again, and they get written about, and I don't have the answer to, will the writing stop it? Uh, it's at least drawing attention to it. It's a good point, and just as your book tells a personal story and draws attention to other people 
that were deeply involved in significant ways uh, in, in the civil rights movement. I'm wondering whether, and there are calls for this, whether it is time for us to revise and to update and to rewrite some of our own history uh, so that more people have a better understanding of the truth as it's now being called out. What do you think about I think that? That's, I think that's what I'm doing. I think that's what I'm doing in this book. I'm saying, gee, you know what? Who's written about the Montgomery bus boycott? And really, it was a pivotal moment in the history because it kick-started the modern civil rights movement. It was the one uh, direct action movement that gave the courage to other people, to other Black people to have, uh, you know, uh, sit-ins at lunch counters, uh, asking for integrated integration at lunch, lunch counters and freedom rides. And, um, you know, it gave the impetus for people and the courage for people to go on and do that. And so for, what I'm doing is filling in some blanks because there wasn't a lot written about the boycott right away. When it first happened, Martin Luther King wrote a book, Stride Toward Freedom. Uh, and then it was really 30 and 40 years later that anybody was interested or cared much enough to write about it. And it was, you know, Rose Parks wrote a book in the 1990s and Joanne Robinson, who we talked about from the Women's Political Council, she wrote about how uh, uh, the boycott and, how, and the women who started it, so, and how active women had been. But a lot of the books that came out a little bit before that were books that were written by um, Parting the Waters, Daring the Cross, written, written by white people who were not really involved and connected with the, with the, the boycott. So I feel like I have a personal tie through my uncle, through my father, through my mother, through uh, the people I knew. And I went back to, to find out more. And I thought, well, let me just go. I can tell you what I did. I went to, I got interviewed, of course, my father and my, before he passed away and my uncle. And I followed my uncle around because he's still talking to uh, people about, uh, you know, what happened and is receiving honorary doctorate degrees and honors for what he did. But I also joined a civic organization called One Montgomery. They and another group called the Friendly Supper Club, they invite, uh, he, they thought that, let, let's just say that they grew out of an incident of racial turmoil in the 80s in, in Montgomery. And the thinking behind both of those groups was if we sit black and white people down together and they start talking, just to each other, they can understand each other more and maybe we can avoid some of the racial problems we've been having. So I, uh, and they, you know, sit down and they do it over a meal. I went to one Montgomery and I told them I was working on a book and I needed, I was doing some research. Was there anybody who could help me point me in the direction of people and places so I can understand what happened during the boycott? And I sat down at my table and a lady leaned over and she's a white woman. She leaned over and she said, you want to talk to me? My father was Clyde Sellers. Clyde Sellers was the racist police commissioner during the bus boycott who uh, did almost everything he could to, to block integration from happening. And so I learned, I, you know, I spent a lot of time meeting people like that and going and sitting down in their homes. I took a camcorder with me to record the interviews to find out little bits and pieces of what life was like and what really was going on during the boycott. So I can fill in some blanks. What a marvelous story. Um, we have a question from another former president of the National Press Club, Donna Linewan Legere. And um, it is, you became a journalist which precludes you from participating in protest and activism in general. In light of your family background, what pressures did you feel to participate in activism and how have you dealt with it? I didn't feel any pressure to participate in activism. My parents had lived their lives. My dad had done what he wanted to do. And as a matter of fact, when I was in college, uh, you know, we were protesting things like the Vietnam War. And, um, you know, uh, we were trying to get more African-American uh, professors and uh, teaching at the college. And I went to Ohio University um, to get more classes about, you know, African-American studies. I do recall, uh, 
my first year, I think it was my first year, I was living in a new dorm and there was going to be a black floor section. And I went home and I told my dad, yeah, we're, I'm probably going to be living on the black floor section at OU. And he said, do you know how hard we fought to get integration and now you guys are going to resegregate yourselves? He was very disappointed. <laughs> we lost uh, Congressman John Lewis just a few weeks ago. And uh, he repeated many times that w without the press, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. Um, and in fact, President Lyndon Johnson told Martin Luther King at one point to call as much press attention as he could to those peaceful marches that he believed would be the most likely to result in attacks by the Ku Klux Klan in order to help more Americans see the abuse that was taking place in the South on television. And that helped gain momentum for the passage of the Voting Rights Act uh, in, in, in the 1960s. Um, do you see the coverage of what's been happening over the course of this spring and summer as having the same effect? In other words, is there longer term good coming out of the tragedies that that we've been experiencing this year? Well, the, the media coverage back in the, in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, I do think made all the difference because it showed, uh, you know, fire hoses on little children and people being beaten down by police officers on horses. And it showed that the peaceful protesters were people who were really taking the moral high ground. And so, you know, fast forward to what's going on now, or we could go back to the uh, when when King was killed, and the, there were all those demonstrations across America, uh, where people were burning down neighborhoods. And I, I think when you see that, and you know, early in the protests uh, after George Floyd was killed, when you saw people uh, defacing property and knocking down statues, and you know, burning down buildings, that you are, you know, um, negating what could be uh, sympathy for your cause. I think that um, John Lewis sympathized with the, the, the marchers who were peacefully demonstrating and saying, hey, the killing of George Floyd was all wrong. But I think he and King really deeply believed in the philosophy of, you know, non violent civil disobedience, peaceful demonstrations to accomplish your goals. The press is having a pretty tough time today. Um, I won't push you in a corner uh, to talk about the president uh, of the United States, but, but he's on the attack daily against journalists, and, and we all know it. Uh, newspapers um, and uh, television and radio stations are downsizing, and more than a few have shut down altogether uh, over the past few years. And now we have reporters that are risking their own health and, and, the, and the health of their families by running toward danger, which is what journalists do, uh, in, into the coronavirus pandemic. Um, that said, we're also seeing some very compelling journalism, some of the best ever um, uh, this year. And students are enrolling in, in college journalism programs in, in great numbers. So let's go back for a few minutes about the role of the press in today's world, which you have been so much a part of for, for more than 40 years, and how those following in your footsteps as beat reporters and anchors can, can see this through. What, would you, what, what do you have to say about the younger journalists that are out there now? Well, I will just say that what I learned and what was, I was taught as a journalist and at Columbia's journalism school uh, was that as a reporter, I was supposed to be as objective as possible in covering events and not take sides. You know, just, it was almost, you know, present this side, present that side, and you're somewhere in the middle saying, I'm not taking a side. How can you look at what's going on right now and, and not take a position? Um, I look back at, suppose, suppose I had been a young journalist covering Nazi Germany, would ha, would, how would I have covered Hitler? You know, when you, when you see things that are just really wrong, I think you have to call them out. And it, sometimes you just can't be as objective as, I, as we were taught to be 
as young and, and upcoming journalists. And so I'm seeing people now just telling the truth by saying, you know, the president is a liar. He told something that's not a true, and it's not a true thing. And, and, you know, you just have to do what you have to do. We have another question from Jeff Ballou. Your family met the moment in helping to dismantle segregation. Do you see what's happening today as another generational moment? Um, we, we have seen, and you mentioned the, the killings of some of the other young black men in recent years, and we saw protests, and because the news cycle moves so fast and, and there's so much information out there that the protests stopped receiving coverage after a little while, and then there, there was an uneasy calm that came after, and then something else happened, and the same thing repeated, and the same thing repeated. One of the things that we've been seeing this year is the sustainability of, of these protests. When there was violence near the beginning, um, that, that was attributed to certain factions, and more people came out peacefully to, to demonstrate. And we've, we've seen the sustaining of these, uh, of these demonstrations. So the question becomes, are we on the cusp of something bigger right now than the, the, the tragedy and, 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 and how hard it is to see another young black man killed by police and then we move on to something else? Is there something bigger happening right now? It feels like something bigger is happening. It feels like this is, is a moment of reckoning that we are not going to just stop. Uh, you know, the, the protests are going on around the country almost every day. And we're approaching uh, an anniversary of the March on Washington, 57th anniversary coming up on the, the 28th of this month. And there's going to be a big march. Um, they're expecting 100,000 people. And I don't think it's going to stop there. Uh, I'm starting to see changes on television. You know, uh, what's it? Uh, one of the networks teaming up with Telemundo. And so we're learning more about, you know, uh, the Hispanic population that I, you know, even just commercials, you know, are starting to show families that are mixed where there's a white parent and a black parent and a mixed child. So I, I think we're on the edge or the cusp, as you said, of, of something big, and I don't see it changing overnight. And I think it's gonna be a good thing. Could you see your book being used in classrooms as a, as a, as a teaching tool? <laughs> uh, that, was, that was my hope, uh, that because I'm finding so many people know little about this particular protest, and I think it was a very important one. And so, I have expanded the story uh, to talk about white allies. There were white people who risked their names and reputations and, and relationships with their friends by, by helping. Um, I could name some of the Reverend Ray Watley was a, a Methodist minister who preached about the evils of segregation from the pulpit. And, they, and the Methodist leaders drove him out of town. You know, uh, there were, the Clifford Durr was an attorney who helped my uncle Fred become a good lawyer. He was also the person, he and his wife, Virginia, who went with E.D. Nixon to bail Rosa Parks out of jail. Uh, you know, those are people who were very helpful. Uh, you don't hear about that narrative very often. And I think that I have some stories to tell that people need to learn about. And I would love to have young children um, hear more about this story. How long did you work on the book? It pains me to tell you this, Michael. Five years, it did take me five years to write this story. As soon as I uh, retired from Channel 5, I said, I'm gonna do this, this is, this is my goal. I took a little road trip and I pulled up at my grandmother's old house in Montgomery and I stayed there for about a month or so. And, uh, you know, went to the archives to look up things and found some oral histories, did my own oral histories, um, came back to DC, went to the Library of Congress, which had the house, the papers, Rosa Parks papers were housed at the Library of Congress. They were on loan at the time. They have now been permanently gifted by the Howard Buffett Foundation. 
but all of her papers and manuscripts and books and letters to friends that really illuminate who she was and how she was not that quiet. And people thought she was a little old lady. You know, she was only 42 years old when she refused to give up her seat. So she, she wasn't old and really tired. Just as she said, I think, sick and tired of the treatment that she was getting. Five years is a long time to work uh, on, a, <laughs> on, a, on a project. Um, but it, it sounds like it was truly a labor of love for you um, to go through this. Um, I'm, I'm curious, as a, as a broadcast journalist, uh, which perhaps has some similar skill sets uh, uh, in digging for, for things, um, talk about the difference between writing for, uh, for broadcast news and writing a book. Oh, it's totally different. Uh, you know, uh, TV news, you go in, you write your story in a day. You go out, you interview a few people, you talk to them on the phone, you write a little story, and then you're done. You gotta dig a little deeper when you're writing a book. Uh, you've got to think about it a little harder. You know, it's not just, you know, it. I took some writing workshops and I met um, other writers who talked about, uh, putting together a draft. Well, I had my first draft. I thought, ah, I've, I've been in broadcasting for all these years. I can write a story. And I wrote a draft of the book and I took it to my uncle and he looked at it and he put it in a little binder and he said, oh, this is great. And he wrote on their draft number one. And then I had um, an author friend of mine take a look at it and she said, this is not your story. Uh, you need to think a little deeper about what it is you're trying to say uh, this is more biographical, and it doesn't really tell your story like it's your story. So you really have to, you know, I mean, I did a lot of interviewing. I did a lot of writing and rewriting and rewriting. So there were several drafts before I got to something that resembled what you're seeing now. It does. Uh, it, 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 it takes a small village to make, to make this work, and, and we all need editors, and it's good to have people that both cheer you on and people that scrutinize what you do along the way, right? Let me say this. I had a little core group of good friends who were my readers. My, they call them beta readers. And they read chapters they, as I went along. Um, and I had uh, one group, some of you might know some of the names. Um, uh, Jan Smith used to work at Channel 5. Lark McCarthy used to anchor at Channel 5. Cynthia Steele Vance. And I have a real close friend, Carolyn Harvey. They would read my chapters and send me back very honest feedback, um, which, you know, sometimes can be heartbreaking. But it was very good. And, I, and one other story I'd like to tell you about is how the book got named, because I used to keep a running list of, of names of uh, what the book should be. And it had gotten the, the one topic, the, the title that I was running with at the time was to destroy everything segregated, which was what my uncle's mission was. So I was having lunch with uh, Jan and Mark and Cynthia one day and they said, well, you know, that sounds so angry. You don't want to alienate a lot of people. Why don't we, why don't you do something about the brothers? It could be the brothers Gray and something about civil rights or this and that or the other. And then Lark said, yeah, but you know what? If, if you do it that way, it's you're telling their story. Why isn't this your story and what you learned and how it's affected your life? Why don't you call it Daughter of the Boycott? So Lark McCarthy named my book. <laughs> it's a wonderful name. It's a wonderful name. Um, Karen, your parents didn't live to see the book published. Your uncle has. Um, yes. Uh, and wrote the foreword uh, to to the book. Um, this it must be very meaningful for you, for for your uncle to to see what you've done. Uh, we have, you know, he's been one of my favorites since I was a little girl. Calling him Uncle Teddy. He, my parents were sort of party people, and so uh, my uncle sometimes babysat for me and my two brothers, and would come over and bring a, you know bunch of ice cream with them and we so we love to see him and we've called him Uncle Teddy he's been a very dear figure in my life for many many years and I you know for him this is an extension of his story uh and uh he, you know I think he's proud that I wanted to write it and that I have written some things and he didn't tell me what not to write 
he just said, let me see what you're writing when you're done. And he read one draft and he said, I don't have to read all the others. You're on the right track. <laughs> so. Uh, we have another question for you uh, from a press club member. What would you tell the Black Lives Matter leaders today about leadership, success, and the art of change based on your research and your writing? Leadership. Okay, here's one thing that I, you know, and, and I, I'm never trying to be the expert, uh, but I do think that there was something to learn from the uh, peaceful protest and not um, um, destroying property. Though I, I, I have talked to people who have said that, uh, you know, we're seeing history repeat itself. And if the peaceful protests didn't really work before, why should we try it again? Maybe we need some new tactics. Um, are the new tactics to burn everything down? Personally, I don't think so. Um, but I did talk to a young man who was protesting across the street from the White House after uh, the protest first started. And I said, you know, first of all, you're exposing yourself to the COVID virus with all these people down there. And, you know, what about the people who are out there looting? How, how, how can you identify with people who are, are looting from these buildings? And he said that he understood why um, some of the looters were looting, though he did not agree with them, but he felt that they were, uh, they were doing something, if, you know, they didn't own those buildings. Um, the, the retailers weren't trying to really relate to them. Um, it wasn't their property. And so he understood, but, you know, didn't agree. Um, I, I would say looting is not the answer. And, you know, I think people have mixed feelings about the Confederate statues and the flags that do they belong in museums uh, as opposed to, you know, out in public as, as you know, honoring people who were traitors to the country. Um, I'm personally not going to go and yank down a Confederate monument, but, you know, I think it probably has a better place in a museum. It's interesting you mentioned that. Uh, Ken Burns joined us here at the Press Club uh, just about three weeks ago, the documentary filmmaker, and he was saying that a number of Confederate statues went up in 1954 at the time of Brown versus Board of Education, and that they mm -hmm. were erected by the Ku Klux Klan, and that okay. to keep them up <laughs> is a reaffirmation of, of white supremacy, and uh, his take on it was that they should all come down they, they, they should all come down. And um, again, I, I just go back to the way we've written our history as a country and whether um, our new history books that are taught in schools should contain much more accurate information as we rethink um, uh, people of history in this country and what their places were um, in history. I, I agree with I agree with that. And, and I say, you know, if you take them down, put them in the museum with an explanation, not erase the history, but say this did happen. I don't want to throw it away. So you never know that there were these horrible people who uh, seceded from the union and, you know, uh, wanted to keep slaves to, you know, farm their cotton. Right. You um, know, tell the story, but. Uh, let's. Um we only have a few minutes left. Let's, I'd like to talk about takeaways from, from your book. Um, what, what were some of your takeaways, having researched it, having written it over a five-year period? Um, as you look at your book now, as you, uh, as you probably have gone back through a good part of the book, what are your takeaways from the book, and what would you like others to take away from it? I think the main takeaway <clears throat> is that uh, hopefully we can learn some lessons from the history and, and make some changes. And that really uh, extraordinary results can come from the efforts of ordinary people. Because this was just a community of regular old people who decided that they wanted to make some drastic changes and they wanted to seek racial social justice 
and they plan, sat down and they planned for it and they refused to ride the buses in Montgomery for 382 days. How do you get that many people to agree to one thing for one goal? So that that's an important, you know, you can you can get something done. My uncle says you just gotta you gotta plan it. It didn't just happen. And how about yourself? What's um what's next for you now that you have uh, four decades in journalism, you've written a book. Uh, what's next for Karen Gray Houston? <laughs> you know, I, I think I have a couple, Michael, a couple of, of books left inside me, but whenever this question gets asked to me and I'm around my husband, he says, I don't have a second book in me himself. <laughs> he can't take it. It's a lot of work, a lot of stress, so, you know. Uh, I gotta take a little break at some point and then uh, maybe start writing a second book. And do you have a topic yet for the second book? You do? You just hang around. You just hang around and we'll see. Oh, you don't want to share it yet? Okay. All right. As, as we round it up, a lot of people have been struck by the fact that here we are in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, my mask is right here. I'm sure you are wearing a mask and those you love are wearing masks. We're, we're trying to protect ourselves. We're trying to protect our loved ones from this invisible monster that is the coronavirus crisis. People went out and are continuing to go out and protest for a cause knowing, and you talked about it a few minutes ago, that there is, from, from the person who was in front of the White House, that there is, there is risk to them. There is health risk. So everybody is, is taking a risk for a cause now. That's, that's quite a remarkable statement in itself, isn't it? Yes, it is. The young boy I was talking to said that he was going out and I said, aren't you afraid of the virus? And he said he was, he's more concerned about social justice. So he's willing to take that risk. And that's more important than, he, than, than just the virus. And he's not alone. <laughs> there are obviously a, a lot of people that are, that are willing to take that risk. Well, that is going to be our last word. Um, our thanks to Karen Gray Houston, whose new book is Daughter of the Boycott, Carrying on a Montgomery Family's Civil Rights Legacy. Karen, we are pleased to present you with our National Press Club coffee mug. And uh, we will send this to you. Uh, with our sincere appreciation and I hope that you can join us again in person in the very near future. So great good luck to you and thank you so much. Thank you. Honored to talk to you. Can't wait for my cup. Our thanks to our producer for today's program, Lindsay Underwood, our headliners, co-team leaders, Donna Line, Juan Leger and Lori Russo, the coordinator of today's program, our vice president, Lisa Matthews, and our terrific National Press Club team behind the scenes here in the Broadcast Operations Center. We thank our members and guests for your good questions and for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day.